Today's reading is from Acts chapter 16, verses 9 through 15, on page 119 in the New Testament. A vision compels Paul to move his ministry into Greece. There he meets Lydia, an important person in the business community, whose heart has been opened by God to receive the gospel. Her conversion and baptism provide the impetus for the founding of the church at Philippi. The reading begins at verse 9. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia, pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Theatra and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she prevailed upon us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus answered Judas, not Iscariot, Those who love me will keep my word. And my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my word. And the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away, and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. So as we just experienced with the kids up here, um, that concept of peace is kind of hard to explain. There's a lot of words that give you a piece of it, different piece. <laughs> but the whole concept is a little confusing. It's natural to hear that this is a promise of God uh, through the lens of being a Minnesotan in 2019, because that's where we live. Peace would be great to have in our schools, wouldn't it? So that children do not have to worry about bullying or lockdown drills or racist pictures in their yearbooks. Peace in our homes, that sounds amazing. That lack of anxiety over unpaid bills. When will all the projects be finished? Where will my children sleep tonight? Do I have enough food on the table? Payday isn't for another few days and my wallet's empty. The latest Pew Research says that while the inflation costs continue to rise, salaries have remained virtually the same for 40 years. Peace around the world? Well, that's been a beauty pageant mantra for a long time. I want world peace. But wars and rumors of wars are always with us. So what exactly is Jesus talking about when he promises to leave his peace with us? Like most of the concepts that we hear from Jesus, we use our 21st century finite brain to figure it out and make it make sense to us, make it logical. And then when we do that, we narrow its meaning to fit our box. 
You see, the word means more than just lack of confidence or conflict, lack of anxiety, lack of warfare. In fact, it's possible to live in a place where there is no war, where you have a house to sleep in. There is food in the cupboard and the refrigerator, and yet there's this internal anxiety that springs up from some unknown place, and it doesn't go away. Anyone living with the effects of trauma knows what I mean. The trauma may have happened years and years ago, and yet the effects of that trauma continue to wreak havoc on a person's sense of well-being and safety. It's possible to live with extravagance, to have more money in the bank than you know what to do with, and yet you still live with this inner sense of anxiety that comes from grief or depression or living with addiction, being emotionally or physically bullied, coming from a society where the color of your skin or the clothes that you wear or the place that you worship is continually dehumanized and devalued and diminished. That creates anxiety and a lack of peace. You see, when Jesus says, my peace I leave with you, he's talking about all of that and so much more, just wiped away, gone. That's called shalom. We don't have an English word for it. Shalom is more than just a temporary state of feeling at ease with whatever situations are going on now. Shalom is a way of life. It's not the lack of conflict. It's being complete in God's eyes. It's being wholly, completely who God has made you to be right here, right now, despite the circumstances in and around you. Why don't we get that? This is a promise from 2,000 years ago, and yet we continue to live in fear and anxiety and have that lack of peace. And I think it's because we've intellectualized it way, way too much. The lesson we just heard Nancy read from the book of Acts is about a woman who lived 2,000 years ago who owned her own business, who had her own household, her name was Lydia, and she was a dealer in purple cloth. I don't know if they had tie-dye back then, but, you know, those of the rest of you wearing purple today, she thanks you. So there are a number of women in here and men who love them who have done some pretty amazing things in our culture, broken through what's called the glass ceiling, worked in places where they were told, you know, that's really not where you should be as a woman. And whether those words are said explicitly or just implied, you know it when you hear it. We have the Me Too movement. We have the, the push for equal pay for equal work. And yet, even though this has been a priority for many people sitting in this room for a long, long time. We still have a long way to go. But think about what it must have been like 2,000 years ago. Because 2,000 years ago, women not only uh, were not named often in Scripture, the fact that we even know Lydia's name says a lot. <laughs> but they didn't have power or influence. You couldn't even speak to them. They couldn't speak to you if you were a man in public. And if you spoke to them, you were, you know, odd as a man. We can't imagine what it was like to be one of the only women around to have that kind of power and property. There wasn't any group that she could join to, to talk about her experiences because there weren't many like her. And then this guy called Paul comes along and sits with other women and talks to them about this rabbi who brings shalom. 
this rabbi who brings peace that goes beyond the circumstances, that covers her, even her, living this unusual experience as a woman in power and prestige. And it affected her so much that she and her whole household were baptized that day. To walk in the way of this rabbi who promises peace was a promise she couldn't imagine. And she grasped a hold of that promise. I wonder why we don't get that excited ourselves to think of that kind of promise. If we're worried or anxious, why we don't lean on the, the Lord that promises peace. Well, I think it's because our culture has told us that if you're worried or anxious, there's probably a really good reason and you should get up and do something about it pretty darn quick. Don't just sit around and wait for someone to fix it for you. Because this promise of Jesus sounds a little like magical thinking. But it's not. Because the power of God doesn't work like some magic. It works through you, people. You are the hands and feet of Christ right now, bringing the shalom, the peace of God to God's people. God's shalom comes to God's people through God's people. It isn't magic. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, that's what changed when Jesus showed up. Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection was all about bringing creation to this point, to this place, to this ascension of Jesus where he ascends to the Father and the Holy Spirit is left to indwell with each and every one of us so that we might carry on the work of God, bringing God's shalom to all places, to all people. Because when God's peace is present, God is present. And Jesus tells us how to do that. If you love me, you will obey my commands and I and the Father will make my home with you, he says. I I'm going to be with you. I'm making my home with you, bringing my peace to you. If you love me, you will obey my commands. So what is Jesus' command? Love one another. Hello. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. Love. It's that easy. <laughs> and it's that hard. Love is not this mushy word that's just all about emotion. Love is a verb. It's action. It's getting to work to make sure that your neighbor is loved so much that whatever anxiety or fear is causing them to stay awake at night is taken care of through you. A letter that John wrote, 1 John, the fourth chapter, he says this, perfect love casts out all fear. What a tool. Love is the most powerful tool that God has given us. To love and follow Jesus' command to love your neighbor means a whole lot more than just Minnesota nice. It means that you and I and all of us, Bethlehem, will do whatever needs to be done to see that our neighbor has a roof over their head, has food on their table, has access to health care. They're not alone. To follow Jesus' command, you must love your neighbor as yourself, means you will work for change within the institutions of our culture that bring dehumanizing effects of racism and sexism and whatever ism is, because these are built in to our systems. And so we have to work to get it out so that all people are treated with dignity and love and have the shalom of God. You're already doing it. Bethlehem. When you visit your neighbor who can no longer attend worship or other social functions, you're helping to remove someone's loneliness and usher in some shalom into their life. When you spend time or resources assisting Catholic Charities Food Shelf as Bethlehem is doing during the month of May, 
You help alleviate the fear and anxiety of homeless, of hunger for someone and usher in God's shalom for that family. When you meet with others in our community to address the housing crisis that exists right here in St. Cloud and our surrounding communities, you're helping to remove someone else's fear of living without shelter and bringing a piece of shalom into their life. When you share from your abundance so that the ministries of Bethlehem can continue to reach into the lives of children and youth and families and all generations, you are helping others learn how to walk in the way of this rabbi so they can share the shalom of God with others. This is my prayer. That when we leave this place today filled to the brim with the shalom that only Jesus can bring, we will boldly share that peace through our loving actions with everyone we meet. No exceptions. May it be so. Amen.